Getting that, I'm getting that, I'm getting that, I'm getting that, I'm getting that, Horace Mann, what would he do? What kind, what? Say it again. Yeah, the school system guy with his, yeah, public education. And, oh, what would you call when Adam Smith Adam Smith talked about that interaction of supply and demand that would set the price of the market. And there were there were markets before capitalism. And so capitalism is kind of more an extreme market, but it's still a market. What will set the price? What will set how many people enter the, the market to buy or to sell or to produce the goods? What did he call that? Well, that, that is competition. But what did he call that where the price, the interaction of supply and demand, they find some equilibrium? The amount of people supplying the goods, the buyers, it would set a price. What did he call that? Yes. The invisible thing. Yeah, the invisible hand of the market. With the idea being, if the market, all things being equal, all things being equal, he always would say that this, this is an idealized system because all things are not equal. All things being equal, all people making rational decisions, all people acting in their own self interest. All people act, I should add, acting rationally, which this might surprise you, human beings are not exactly always rational. So there were things that he encountered. This is an idealized situation. Oh, so what is that difference between revenue and cost? I gave you that name. It's profit, what kind of profit? Yeah, that marginal profit. Hard to control revenue, but what is the best way to drop your cost to become more what? Yeah, efficient. And the best way to become efficient, you remember that? What did you say? Yeah, I, I have to, to make more money. Yeah, that would be the easiest way. What's the best way to become more efficient? What is it called? Yeah. Well, but machine, even before machines, instead of having one person try to do everything at once, what do you do? Yeah, division of labor, one person. And that's why machines come in. That's where machines come in. The machines do it. And then the workers go from being their skill to the person just operating the machines, which is a big, big shift in capitalism. So we got to, you know, this is pre-capitalism. Everyone's trying to cut costs together. Let's get to a couple of things really quickly. So everyone's in competition. Just to repeat that thing, everyone's trying to cut costs. Everybody's trying to cut costs. Just the same way consumers are trying to find the best price. Everybody's trying to do the same thing to get your higher your better marginal profit wherever you might be. So, all things being equal, everybody's trying to become more efficient. What about wages? Can you just cut wages? If you cut wages, all things being equal, what will happen to you? what will happen to your workers? What will they do? You go to your competitors. They'll poach them off. If you cut your wages, and this would be the big shift. There were elements of this before, but never like this before, the creation of the wage system. People were not paid this way before the Industrial Revolution. Most people. There were elements of this. There was some proto-capitalism, but wages. And the realization is that you really have a difficult time, all things being equal, controlling wages, just as a worker is also stuck in the wage system. What decides wages? Hmm? Well, costs have a big element of that. It's a relate, this relates to it. Let me ask you this. Let's say you're, um, you want to get a job and there's a lot of unemployed people at the same time looking for a job. What does that do generically for wages? If there's a lot of unemployed people, Drops. There's an oversupply of workers. Same thing. If you are trying to get a job and there's virtually nobody looking for jobs because everyone has a job, there's no unemployed. What does that do for wages? Yeah, because companies will compete and they'll try to demand, or they will compete and they'll try to raise their wages to try to get more workers or poach workers from other places. The same thing. If you're working in a place where there's a lot of unemployment, you say, "Well, I don't want." I, or I need higher wages, prices are going up. There's a thousand people want your job, shut up and take it. Wages are decided 
in the market too. The same kind of market, the labor market, supply and demand. And this was different. Oh, sure, there were elements, and you could see market forces before capitalism, but never like this and never at a wide scale. Never. So this is one of the things that just, it's going to blow people away. It's going to be such a major shift. Wages will be set by the market. So what happens if profits go up for a company? What does that do to wages? Profits go up. What happens to wages? Wages have no effect because wages are set in the market. If profits go down, no effect. I mean, you could start a business and be losing money, but you still have got to pay higher wages if you can find no one to get your job, take your job. Especially if you got loans to pay off, you borrowed money to start a business, you got to pay them back. That means you got to pay whatever wage is necessary to get your business going. Profits. They're not, wages and, wages and profits do not relate. Who gets all the profit? Who? Yeah, whoever has the capital, they get the profit. The profit is not set by this. So a company can be making boatloads of money and they could be cutting wages. Think how hard that would be, a big shift. I work harder doesn't affect my wages. Speaking of that, does hard work affect your wages? No effect. No effect at all. Does not affect your wages. So who's got a job when they got a W-2? You had a job where you have been to this where you got a W-2, you work someplace, got a job, raise your hand, you had that job. A few people, a job like you get a W-2, you pay taxes, yeah. Yeah. now you go through the, you get money deducted out of your paycheck, yeah. Some of you have, you know, some of you might have worked in other places where you work with other people, but you really notice if you start working outside of them. Let's work with somebody. And they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything and got paid the same as you or more. For that person, didn't do anything and got paid the same. Not here, I mean, but there's people out there. Yeah, that's the wage system. That is the wage system. Hard work has no effect on wages. Now you might say, wait a second, I work really hard and the boss came to me and said, you're gonna get a raise. No, they made a calculation. It'll be harder to hire somebody and train them who does that job, than make sure they keep you. So that's a calculation based upon the wage system. It doesn't mean you shouldn't work hard, not only because especially in times where there's a lot of unemployed people, you might lose your job. And there is something valuable about getting something done. Hard work does have a value. Let's try to accomplish something that feels good. And there's something else. If you have a job, when you're working, the time goes faster. That's a logical thing like that. You gotta be pragmatic. Skill, the skill affect your wage. Skill has no direct effect unless that skill is in demand. Does that make sense? If you have a skill, but so everyone else has the same skill, yeah. Oh, but that's because something steps in outside the market, you know, some religions, So a union steps outside of the market, and so it's no room for religions. And that's why companies don't want unions. So you're exactly right. That does happen, but that's only if they would they have to negotiate in the market. Does that make sense? And so with this, so back in the 1930s, now most people didn't have high school diploma. You know, they went to about eighth or ninth grade, and then most people just barely over half. So high school diploma alone, just having a high school diploma got you a higher wage. But by the 1960s and 70s, virtually everyone out of that school diploma. So there was no effect on wages anymore. Just having the high school diploma in the 1930s gave you a higher wage. Because there weren't very many people like that. 
in the 60s and 70s, just having a college degree, regardless of what the degree was in, just having that degree was scarce. And so that was in more demand. Today, not anymore. And all of you know that. Probably a lot of you think I'm going to go, if, I, if I'm going to college or some kind of education after high school, I'm thinking I'm going to have to specialize. Does that make sense to everybody? That's because of supply and demand. And so that, it's really hard to handle. I mean, think about, you work harder and it doesn't affect your wages too much. You work harder and the profit goes to somebody else. Now, of course, you can have the point of view of the capitalist. I took the risk, I get the profit, but it's a really hard thing for people to accept because it was so new. Today, we all just kind of know that's the way life is. For most people, that's the way it's going to be, good or bad. It was really hard. People had to be kind of trained. That's why it's such a dramatic shift, the Industrial Revolution. And now you leave because of that. So here's the thing then. We have all this risk. And the wage system, make sure you just can't cut wages. And so how do you limit the risk, especially for companies, people you want to have? If you as a nation want now, manufacturing and purchasing capital, how do you limit the risk or how do you get rid of risk? Limit the competition. If there's less competition, there's less competition for workers, there's less competition for machines, there's less competition for raw materials. If there's less competition, you can raise prices. So let's get to a, a, an incredibly important concept, economies of scale. Scale, size. This is the iron rule of economics. Put a star and an asterisk by it, economies of scale. Scale, size. So think about division of labor. If you're small, if you're a small company, how much division of labor can you have if you only have a few employees? But if you have a thousand employees, think of all the different areas you can become more efficient. Or for that matter, if you're really big, think about if you want to buy raw materials. Couldn't you negotiate a better deal if you're bigger? You want to be about, you know, like, hey, I'm going to buy half of your iron, my steel mill. Give me a deal. I'm going to buy, you know, a few pounds. You want to sell all. Your companies want to sell more to one company because they know they have an assured market, so they give people the deal. Economies of scale, big, has a competitive advantage, always. And the big reason is efficiency. Now, big can also be very inefficient, but just the size alone allows them to have lower costs. So everyone got lower costs, more efficient. Big has that advantage, always. I'm not saying they won't blow the advantage. In the 1960s and 70s, U.S. car companies were the biggest in the world, and they blew that advantage by making relatively unreliable cars. They kind of let the supply chain go to, uh, go to garbage. I mean, all these kind of things, they can happen. But still, all things being relatively equal, we're all competing. The biggest have the advantage. So what does everybody want to do to limit their risk? Become big. Now, the big means more risk, but you become big. The big gives you a competitive advantage. I'll give you a good example of that. Let's say you want to start a grocery store and you build it next to Walmart. How long will you last? It's going to be really hard to compete. Even if you have better service, better quality, they will always be more efficient because of their size. So what can they do? They can drop their costs and therefore drop their prices and undercut. And big can afford short-term losses because they're so big, they can absorb it in other ways. The small can't. You start something on your own, you probably had to borrow money and you've got to make that payment next month. So big has a competitive advantage. Howdy Smith wrote about this. He knew, he talked about this and nobody understood how big would be such a big deal till the machines came and how expensive they were. And so what does a capitalist want to create? So the capitalists are the money controls them? The capital, that's all they are, they're capitalists. What do they want? What is the ideal situation? 
to become big and limit your competition to create something that acts, acts like a what? Yes, exactly. Monopolies. Something that acts like a monopoly. It might not be a full monopoly, but something that acts like it. If there's only two or three companies in a market, it acts like a monopoly. You know, like there's only about three, well, there's only three companies that control about 95% of the phone market. It acts like a monopoly. They kind of set prices together, act like a monopoly. So you can, if, if it's something that people want, you can raise prices. It makes it easier to negotiate deals to drop your cost. And what do monopolies do about wages? Think about it. What do monopolies do to wages? Yes. Yeah, so if you um yeah, if you don't like your job, you're stuck. That's one thing about education. You mentioned teachers. We have that. Who hires teachers? Now, the school district, because they were kind of, we have monopolistic powers. Now, we have negotiated and done some things, and also in the state constitution about pensions and things like that, but yeah, there's I'm a, um, have that issue here. Yeah, monopolies cut wages. Monopolies lower wages. So there's lots of things to have in monopolies. Oh, what happens to quality of goods? If you have no competition, do you need to produce good stuff? Why? Why do you suppose people? Yeah, go ahead. And so there's one basic cable company which also does. Uh, a broadband internet in this area, it's spectrum. And if you ever have to get service from them, it's really difficult. Okay, the workers work, work their tail. It's a hard job. They just don't hire very many. And so it takes a long time to get there because they have a monopoly. There's a reason for that. So when my sister-in-law lives in Germany, comes here, she's been there for, again this Christmas year, comes here, and she is just in awe. Two things, how bad our internet is here, and uh, how much it costs. Just blows her away. Germany, um, they just have a different system. Why? Monopoly. So with that, what we have is capitalism. A market economy, so the markets before, but not basically everything's for sale. Everything. We'll get to this more in just one second with two distinct classics. And they are classics because there is kind of those with the capital and those with art. And for some reason, I made this really small font. The capitalist, it's also called the bourgeoisie. And this picture right here is of robber barons. Uh, those are people on the Rhine River would steal from people using rafts on the Rhine back in the, in the 12th century. These are what industrialists are going to be called after the Civil War. So capitalists. Or you see them called the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie was French for middle class. And the middle class were people who were not the nobility or clergymen, but not peasants. So they could make a little bit more. That's what they call the first industrials. They take all the risk. And you can see their point of view. I take the risk. I should get all the profit. But they get all the profit. Don't forget that they also get all the loss. So they want that control. And you can see they want that control. You can see why. And then you have labor. You'll see them called the proletariat too. Proletariat comes from ancient Rome and the Roman Republic. These were the lower class. The proletariat, the proles. They're the workers. And they don't get the product. They get wages set by the wage system. And so you can see the competition here. And these are political arguments because government set the economy, government set the rules. Remember the money supply? Government set the money supply. So now we have a political fight. Is it between these two? And which is bigger, more numbers? Are they be more labor or more capitalists? Not even close, right? What is going to be more pro democracy and it's going to be anti democracy. Now you get all kinds. I was just reading about uh, uh, Mussolini because, because, and fascism in Italy. 
And who supported him? All the industrialists in Italy. So with that, so let's get to a couple of things. If that's the way it is, the market, by definition, and you can make your own value judgment of it, but it promotes inequality. But don't forget, one of the good things about inequality is if you see somebody who's doing quite well, that might encourage you to work harder. And there is a legitimate truth to that. At the same time, inequality is inequality. And those with power usually rig the system so they maintain power. Remember, the we have this all the way from the beginning of our history. And so here's the thing. Let's get back to laws I fair. Remember, laws I fair was hands off of competition. Adam Smith said laws I fair because governments seem to only help monopolies, aka the East India Company, things like the T Act. Who benefits from laws I fair? So let's say the Industrial Revolution began and government said, okay, you can compete any way you want to compete. Hands off. Let the market decide. Who benefits? What type of company benefits from hands off? Say it again. Yeah, yeah the big. Economies of scale. Big companies. What benefit? And that's when that whole thing about the market not being equal. And the, there's never really been a free market because it's always been big. Adam Smith acknowledged that there's big. They'll get a monopoly. Scale. Economies of scale is the iron rule. So Adam Smith looked at this and he said, government has a role. He believed all things being equal. All things being equal, government should be hands off. But what is the role of government? Anti-monopoly. They should break up monopoly, a.k.a. don't allow companies to, to get too big. At the end of the 19th century, in the United States, monopolies were referred to as trusts. And so in a weird way American law is, these are called antitrust laws. It doesn't make any sense now because trusts aren't used the same way. The problem is, no one really read Smith past laws I found. Let's go ahead and read Brett's Adam Smith. So they came to the fact that government has a big anti-monopoly law to make sure companies don't get too big. That was Smith. If companies don't get too big, then Smith said, let companies compete. And if one starts to get too big, well, then government should step in and say, no, you got to sell off pieces and make sure competition exists. And I know we could disagree as they did all throughout the time they tried to enforce this. What is too big? Now, the socialists, a brand new thing we'll get to tomorrow. Socialists looked at this and said, the whole system flawed. This proves. You're never going to be able to do this. Those on top will take over the government and they won't enforce any monopoly. This capitalism is flawed. It's going to create two big classes. Socialism believes in, no, or to limit the classes. Socialism is another thing created with the Industrial Revolution. And so that is kind of what we're at here. Capitalism created this market economy, monopoly, size. So I really want to get this idea that, you know, there was a real disagreement of what this size meant. But this is... Um, the economic system that is created. Capitalism. And there's always a desire in capitalism to get rid of the market and have monopolies. That always exists. Whoever starts a business, you want to have no risk. So there's this all this pressure on. And so here's the uh okay, I thought this was kind of funny. The attack of the invisible and the free market. The big hand. I just thought that was kind of funny. And then this cartoon says, there, there it is again, the invisible hand of the marketplace giving us the finger. Fine. Okay, so with that, distribution of wealth. And so you can see this with the beginning of capitalism. This is the top 1%. Wealth, to be clear, it's hard to measure. I've said this before. But, you know, top 1%, the first wave of capitalism at about 30, 35% of the wealth, over 45 right before World War I. War, 20s, depression, and then constant economic policy to try to um, equalize the class. I think they would get a bigger middle class. 1980s, that went back to uh, the idea of wealth, need more wealth to invest. And it's been like this. This one's actually pretty stark. This is up to 2013, but it's the wealth of the top 0.1%. That's only a few people. Now it's over 35%. We don't know. We're guessing. It's guessing the last couple of years, but wealth has just been just 
pouring up to the ridges. Um, but it is, there is a big distribution of wealth issue with this. And this is something that every society is going to deal with differently and our economic systems will come out of this. Thus, let's get to it. We've already had Hamilton, but now we have a new system. And this is going to be called quasi-fair capitalism. I'm sorry, laissez-faire economics. It's similar to Hamilton. It's similar. Hamilton is a little bit different. But hands off of competition. So it's laissez-faire and competition. Just a second. I made a mistake on this. But by economies of scale, hands off of competition, as we said before, will favor big. And that was the plan. The idea was we, they want to encourage the bigger to become more efficient, more production, therefore more prosperity for the country. They're the ones who know how to create wealth. Very, it should sound a lot like Hamilton, who wanted you know, the assumption bill and protecting tariffs to funnel money to the hands of the merchant capitalists because they're the ones best equipped. He would say, we can agree or disagree on that, but that's the goal. But at the same time, massive government aid to business and also a system set up for the wealth. So remember Adams or Henry Clay's American system, tariffs, bank, internal improvements. That's an example. So don't mess with competition to allow the big and help the big to encourage quicker production. The best case you can see that would be after the Civil War, massive aids to railroad. Yes. Yeah. Now it's not a competition, but you're right. It's there's a contradiction because they're kind of picking the winners, aren't they? By giving government aid to the railroads, you're going to make sure that the Union Pacific will be a massive railroad. Now their argument would be, we want to get railroads built as quick as possible, and so that's the fastest way. It is. And it did build immediately. Now the long-term effect is. That money will funnel to the top, and we could argue that's good or bad. And it that was a system that's going to be created. Now they start arguing this, and this will be—I didn't put this down, but one of the first political parties. This will be the Whigs. This is the Whig plan. And we'll talk more about this down the road. The Whigs. There's not really a, a, an economic idea opposed to this, besides blow the whole thing up with socialism and get rid of it, saying it's unfair. Andrew Jackson had kind of an idea on this. And like it's something similar, even though there's totally different types of people like Abraham Lincoln. But that was that it's just not really a plan. But also encourage immigration. Now, the United States had no, no restrictions on immigration. And so all these people were coming in. And remember when I showed you the different colonial economies? Remember North and South? This is immigration in the United States from 1840 to 1860 through the Civil War. And you notice significantly more immigrants in the North, more diversified economy. That more diversified economy in the North also implied they'd be the ones most able to adapt to capitalism. Yes, it's true. If you've ever been there and wonder why there's so many people of Scandinavian background, the railroads as they went through purposely went to the Kingdom of Sweden, which includes Norway today, and recruited people to come move to Minnesota. Sure, they recruited all these people. So that's why they have that here. And in North Dakota, too. They went to a lot of Germans, too. Like that. That's the capital of Bismarck. But they went here. Now, in the short run, you increase the pool of workers. What happens to wages? In the short run, you increase the pool of workers. They'll drop it a little bit. But in the long run, it might actually increase wages, which did in American history, but it increases the size of the market. More people to buy stuff, more products. Immigration would lead to a lot more creativity in the market, a lot more competition, a lot more new products. The biggest thing you see in immigration, the improvement, the one that I notice most because I really like food, would be with immigrants, how they change food. So much, so many more different varieties and a larger market to buy and sell goods. So with that, now this is going to become, by the 1880s, 1890s, laws that care economics will be called conservative economics. And of course, there'll be some differences, some changes, 
But this is basic element of conservative economics. Of course, there'd be some changes. But hands off of competition and massive government aid, that's conservative economics today. And so we haven't got the other one yet, like an opposition to this. So what we have now created, it's a brand new world. Before 1815, I, I put the asterisk there, is, this is gonna be for the rest of the century. It's not all of a sudden they woke up. January 1st, 1815, like everything's different. Families had to produce goods. Then you had to make pretty much everything you needed. You had to be relatively self-sufficient. You might buy a few things, but you had to do it yourself. Even if you lived in a city, remember I showed you that map of shipping goods. New York City one day was by year. It had to be basically done in your neighborhood. Everything had to be done right there. And society was so much different. And you had to be self-sufficient. And production was done at home. They called it then the putting out system, but right next to it, everyone write, write this next to it. The cot, write down cottage industry next to the putting out system. That means industry in the home. But everyone called it the putting out system. And what it meant was the merchant, this is free capitalism, the merchant would literally put out orders to people who would make them in their home. They would put out orders to people in their home. They would make it there. And you notice the whole family's working. And so just like farmers who needed large families to produce goods, manufacturers, they're all working. Boy, they make this look pretty scary. Look at the eyes on her. Hard backbreaking work, but they're independent. They decide what orders they'll take. They decide how fast they work. They might work as hard, as quick as possible to get the order done, or they might say, you know, we're not going to work today. We're going to take today out. It annoyed the merchants who wanted the control because they said, we got an order, I need it today. But they're independent. They decide. And if they decide not to work, they made that decision. Not they might starve, but that's another story. But they are independent. What the heck was that? And then pay was based upon skill and hard work. A skilled artisan, a craftsman, could charge more because that skill was in such demand and they could literally set the wage. And you could work as much as you want or not work. It's based upon you. So there's a big element of independence and liberty here. Doesn't mean it's not hard. You have a less choice of goods. There's good and bad. But that's before. A brand new world afterward. You start seeing more and more people to by the end of the century, everybody's a consumer. Almost nobody is self-sufficient. Today, nobody is self-sufficient. Nobody. But then the bells ring and all the good little workers go off the bridge. Remember where we quit? So tomorrow, I'll give you a question. We'll do one more practice. These statements on tomorrow. Did it sound good? If you're gonna be gone on Thursday, Friday, just remind me. I hadn't thought about that, but it just it worked out to be Thursday. Yeah. Uh, Friday. See yeah, ya, have a good week. Have a good week. Have a good night. Have a good Halloween. Uh, Friday, I have two choices. I mean, I have one out of the video. If not, we have Have a good, have a good Halloween. Stay out of trouble. I need you. I'm gonna be on Friday. Oh yeah, okay. Where where you gonna work this? Oh cool. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you want to go? Are you thinking about it? So just check with you, Rob. Yeah, and uh, you might be watching the video on Friday or my screen. See you tomorrow. I like the hat.
Who are you? A rat! That is awesome. I can see this coming. Um. <laughs> yes. Are you bring them? Um, huh? I was gonna eat next. I need to work on my presentation. Eat. Wait, Charlie, what are you doing for special projects right here? I'm doing business plot against the PR. We're like they're trying to overthrow in the like the government or something. You're stuck with what you get, are you? So we'll see about bread. I'm going to put papers and all that. I've been on Google through presentations. I'm good. Let me check it out. I'm going to the paper. Do the paper first. I got that. Oh, they just work on the presentation. What's a word doc? Do you want to send it to you or print it? Or? Print it, please. Uh, yeah, I don't have it. And I can't get into my printer without it. We'll figure out stuff. I get just work on that now. But I. Can I get into the print? Yeah, it's been a while. It's so hard for me to read off the computer. Um, I don't think anyone has to actually read it. Unless it's suddenly short. I think it's all bad. Not to see it too bright. Even again, I'm trusting you. Charge.
I'm still filming. I filmed you eating lunch. <laughs> 